in beautiful Saskatoon. It's so lovely here. So I'd like to talk to you this morning about uh, a home blood transfusion pilot that our program in Calgary designed and implemented and talk to you where we're with it today. So I want to start with a patient story. Um, just prior to Christmas in 2014, one, uh, we received a phone call from a physician, um, a physician that we'd received referrals from previously, a Tom Baker Cancer Center physician, asking us, do you guys do blood transfusions? And we have a hard time saying no. And we said, maybe. And uh, he had a patient that was end of life, requiring transfusions and day medicine as it turns out was closed for the holidays and the only alternative for this patient would have been the emergency department and it would have been um, via ambulance because this patient was very frail we did that transfusion so why home blood transfusion so we know blood transfusions improve quality of life in particular for patients living with uh, chronic diseases and patients at end of life and as it turned out, um, there's a large need, an, a large unmet need for transfusions for extremely frail patients um, due to health system capacity issues and barriers um, such as mobility issues. So then we started asking some more questions. Really, home blood transfusions? Isn't this risky? So yes, it does have risks, but any intervention or treatment has risks. Is there precedence? There is precedence in Canada. Uh, Nova Scotia has a home transfusion uh, program that's uh, delivered by uh, RNs, but there was nothing in Alberta. Um, Ron, are there standards? Yes, there are standards. As it turns out, there's lots of standards provincially and nationally. Where are we going to duplicate an existing service? No, not in Alberta. There's nothing, uh, there was no home transfusion program in Alberta. And was there a need? Yeah, there were, we heard that uh, loud and clear from our patients and from our physicians. Is it in scope? Yes, uh, blood transfusions are in scope uh, for paramedics. And are there training requirements? Uh, there are many training requirements. Although we uh, receive the training in school, there's additional requirements um, specifically from Alberta Health Services. So once we asked and answered some of these questions, we thought, you know, let's build, let's build a pilot. And uh, the pilot objective was fairly simple, that to show that blood transfusions can be done in the home by community paramedics safely, and that we can also improve access to this care and improve patient experience. So we leveraged an existing partnership that we had with the Tom Baker Cancer Center, and Ryan spoke to this yesterday. And we also had to partner with Calgary Lab Services, Transfusion Medicine. So this is the group that uh, uh, um, provides all the blood tr components and products in, the, uh, in southern Alberta. So there's lots of teamwork, and this is just a little picture of my partners in crime, Joanna and Tara from Transfusion Medicine. So we, again, asked, asked some questions, identified a lot of the risks. We had some, a good partnership, and now we needed to get more of the stakeholders. So we needed to talk to physicians that specialize in transfusion medicine, our community paramedics, uh, our medical director, a Alberta Health Services Policy and Procedure Department, our college, the lab technicians, and patients and families. We do, as Ryan mentioned, we have a patient advisor for our program. Then we needed to start talking about the design. Uh, we ne knew we needed to meet the applicable standards. We needed to manage and mitigate risks. We needed to develop education practitioners specific to our community paramedics. There was equipment requirements, so we had to purchase specialized coolers and we had to validate uh, those coolers for extremes of temperature and time. Uh, we had to develop procedures and pro protocols. Uh, develop referral criteria for the patient and sort of um, 
overarching, this was project management and change management. In particular, change management, I think many of you have probably designed the, the most brilliant procedure and sort of dropped it onto your practitioner's lap, only to see it fail. So you really have to work on change management. And, and then an important part of this too was um, developing an evaluation for this pilot. And then we had a pilot. A um, little movie reference for you. I don't know if any of you saw Lost Boys. And this, this um, I'm allowed to use vampires. Transfusion Medicine has actually endorsed the use of vampires in any of my presentations about blood. So we designed the pilot. We designed it to start on October the 8th. Uh, the evaluation or the pilot period would be either two months or 40 transfusions, whichever came first. Initially, it was only um, to uh, administer red blood cells. We knew we needed two community paramedics, and that's due to um, standards and also patient safety. You have to verify patient's identity. You have to verify the products or components. Um, we also designed a, sort of a safety mechanism that transfusion medicine physicians would review all of our referrals. Blood is in short supply and you have to ensure the right patients are receiving uh, components or products. Uh, we, the initial design uh, had one location for blood pickup and drop off, and then of course reactions. We had to have a really good plan in place um, for reactions. I mean, they, a lot of these patients, the more transfusions re you receive, the greater uh, your reaction risk is so we had to have, ensure there was protocols in place um, that we had equipment and um, the ability to consult with a physician in real time and of, of course the ability to uh, phone 911. So before we launched the pilot though we decided that we would do a pre-pilot transfusion just to help validate the procedures we developed and to sort of um, just physically do that process to see if, if everything we had developed was going to work well. So this is Mr. Eckert and his wife, and uh, he is, he's since passed away, but he was an ex-RCMP officer, a lovely man, a big man, six foot two. Um, we, we identified him through his physician as sort of our pre-pilot transfusion patient and wouldn't you know it his hemoglobin held for three weeks so we just kept waiting and waiting and waiting and his hemoglobin finally dropped and we were able to do the transfusion so I joined uh, this is one of our community paramedics Dave and we also uh, had transfusion medicine safety lead join us for the transfusion and what's interesting about this is Mrs. Hecker she's pretty tiny she would have to wake up at four in the morning to get him to a 10 o'clock appointment. And they were, essentially it was a 10 hour day for her and she's elderly. Um, she was exhausted, um, but absolutely lovely. Baked us banana bread and was just, re they were so thrilled to have us there. So I guess you know, one thing that I do want to mention that it went well, but it, it made us go back to the drawing board with a couple of things, just in terms of the way we were document, documenting in our EPCR. So we just went to back to the drawing board, made a couple alterations to the pilot, and then we were able to implement the t pilot. So um, evaluation. A lot of these ideas we have, they seem like great ideas, but I think we really need to develop questions, ask and answer questions to determine, are they good ideas? So we had a number of evaluation questions, and they can be you know, loosely um, grouped into three themes, clinical activity and patient safety, uh, patient and family experience, and also our staff experience. So hindsight is a good thing, especially when you're evaluating, um, but evaluation is also very dynamic, those of you who do it. Um, I'm not a researcher. Um, but it's, um, it's not, some of it is real time and some of it is retrospectively. And the, the further along we got in the pilot, we knew we needed to ask, kind of change some of our evaluation questions. Um, and we were able to collect some qualitative and quantitative data. 
and we did surveys, we did interviews and chart reviews. So the, the pilot started, so what did we learn? So um, these are just a, a small sample of some of the quotes uh, from our patients and their families. So I was able to do uh, interview our patients, um, all the patients that were in the pilot. It was an incredibly rewarding um, experience. I know I need to improve my interview skills. I mean, we, I, I came from a background where I, I just wanted a patient to say yes or no. I didn't want the story behind it, so this has been a real shift for me to, to let them talk about their experience. Um, I will say that we have to be mindful of, of some of these, um, some of the data, the qualitative data, because I think there's a, a positive bias. These patients did agree to be part of the pilot, so we have to be very careful. It was a small sample size as well. Um, I did try my best to get the good, the bad, and the ugly from them, but it really was overwhelmingly positive, and it, and it was. This is in a contrast to the transfusions they received in acute care. So nobody's saying that receiving a transfusion in, a, in acute care is a bad experience or a bad thing, but you can see um, some of the comments they made when, when receiving a transfusion in their home. What else do we learn? Um, and, and I don't need you know I don't need you to go through this whole process, but it, that it's kind of complicated. The, the amount of steps that are needed to um, be put into place before you even get to that little small circle there um, are, is incredible. So the transfusion is easy. Our community paramedics can do it with their eyes closed. They're used to administering medications. They're used to monitoring and assessing patients. So that's really quite easy. They're used to talking to patients. But there's all those steps um, that you need to have in place to ensure things are safe and efficient. So we're just like, wow, this is really kind of a complicated thing. Um, the other thing we learned is our community paramedics are incredible. Um, not everyone bakes banana bread. Uh, not every home is clean. Uh, not all patients are easy to talk to. Not all family is easy to talk to. Um, I show you pictures of our paramedics doing things they love. That's, see the, in the corner there, that checkered? Lumberjack, right, Canadian? That's Michelle. What's, what you can't see is that she's about to chop her boyfriend's head off. Um, yeah, so I'm showing you um, pictures of things they love. And what's also interesting is there's patients in here. So they're doing patient care is something they love, riding horses, hiking, or, or things they love too. So without our community paramedics, we, you know, we don't have a home blood transfusion program. So just a couple of the other key findings, um, I'm sure everyone wants to know, were there any adverse events or poor outcomes? No. Uh, the patient family feedback was, again, incredibly positive. Transfusions take a long time, so there's a lot of time, not just on scene, but the pickup and the drop off of the blood and that we really had some issues and challenges with the referral and scheduling processes. So we made recommendations, um, I think 32 of them, and we implemented them all. Um, the biggest recommendation we made was to continue to, this was no longer a pilot, and this was offered as our just regular program services. But we needed to limit them to one a day because it, it, it um, represented a large impact on our program. And we knew that we need to update our referral criteria and our scheduling processes. So these are just a couple of the recommendations that we did implement. Um, on, you can just see here is our referral. Whoa. Gary, and help. This is kind of the way of my life. <laughs> Can everyone start to see the slides? <laughs> That's something about a document recovery. So did it. This is the one or not? This is it? Yeah. What one? Uh, 
keep going. Can I keep going? Keep going. So close. Right there. Sixteen, yeah. From sledge, it's sledge so. yeah. and then from current slide. Let's try that. It's not projecting up there. Locked up. It was crazy. I think we're in 14, right? 16, 16. Almost done. Too. I know. Stay with me. I'm almost done. Yeah. Okay, there. Okay. Got it. Okay, so just quickly, um, impl these are the two uh, like big recommendations were just that um, this was a much desired service. And it, sort of everyone wanted it, so we really needed to refine our uh, cr eligibility criteria. We needed to reserve this for sort of the sickest of the sick, and the, the people that really had um, challenges getting into an acute care setting. Um, we also knew to support our um, patient coordinator with scheduling these. We needed to, um, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts. You need a lot of things in place, we developed a checklist for them. So current state with transfusions. So we continue to do transfusions. Uh, this data is current to uh, May 15th. Um, as of May 15th, we had done 88 transfusions for 31 unique patients. We've had two events that uh, there was a minor transfusion reaction that's, of course, reportable. Um, that the community paramedic was easily um, able to easily manage on scene. We looked at seven day outcomes of these patients just to see um, if they have any you know, reactions. Um, one of the things we do is place a, a, a two hour post transfusion follow up phone call, which is really not standard practice even in day medicine, but because we know that there is maybe some more risk in the community, we, we follow up with a patient, make sure everything's okay. Um, there were two EMS events with, um, from these patients, but upon uh, chart review, it, it didn't appear to be related to the uh, transfusion. It was more um, associated with their disease, a disease progression. Uh, there was 
five ED visits and four were related to a progression of those disease. So a lot of these patients have a cancer diagnosis and not the transfusion. And then one of the patients had just um, an upper respiratory tract infection. So uh, 18 patients had received one transfusion only. 12 patients had two to seven transfusions and one of our patients has uh, had 26 transfusions and counting. Um, we've administered 144 units of red blood cells, 37 units of platelets, and four doses of albumin. So challenges. We continue to sort of uncover challenges and we just, we um, see problems as opportunities for solutions in our program. Um, we know transfusions represent a lar large time commitment, so we've really been looking at sort of novel ways of uh, leveraging, I know there's, uh, I think Hamilton is really doing a good job of leveraging modified duty staff, so we've been doing that with the pickup and the drop off of the blood, also that, uh, that patient identity verification piece. Um, we've opened up additional lab drop off sites, Calgary's a large, large city geographically. And also because it can be, it's a lot of time uh, for the community paramedics on scene with some, some of our patients and some of the homes that are a little more challenging to be in, they have the ability to rotate through the transfusion. Um, we're a small but mighty program with finite resources, so that's why we really have to continue to work on that referral criteria. And also remember our one patient with 25 transfusions, we have to develop discharge criteria as well. At the back end, we are seeking sources of funding. And really this model, when we design this model of care, it, it is transferable to other, it could be dropped into other geographical areas or delivered by other healthcare service types. So we continue to learn. Uh, we encounter sort of a, well, I never thought of that every week. Um, I talk to Tara and Joanna and transfusion medicine, sometimes it seems like daily. Um, we have an FAQ document to support our practitioners. We're looking at different ways of uh, sort of communicating the updates to our practitioners and we have continued plans to interview our patients and then we really work on that communication. While not a driver, you, um, to develop the program we have to look at costs. So um, receiving a transfusion at the Tom Baker Cancer Center is about $1,300. So if you go to the emergency department via ambulance, that's $1,400. And, and I'm, I'll just disclosure, I'm not a health economist. Um, and then when you look at the time for the family or the caregivers, you, you really, it's hard to quantify that, the cost. The, there's financial costs, but there's a whole other bunch of costs we need to consider. But the cost uh, currently for our program in a patient's home seven days a week is $400 and like I said, we're trying to leverage existing resources in the, in the system. Um, but when we think about value, um, you, we can free up some beds in Tom Baker and Day Medicine to, uh, so chemotherapy for instance, so where they can get treatments that aren't currently available in the community. Um, and you can see Mr. Eckert here is sleeping. And what you don't see is that Mrs. Eckert is also sleeping. She was exhausted and like we, we gave her 10, 10 hours of her life back that day. So you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, except if my son's in that he's a terrible goalie. And you can see here we just have a giant snowbank for a, you have a pretty good chance of scoring a goal on this kid. Um, so anyway, thank you for the opportunity.